Uh, hello and welcome to today's episode of The Fix. I'm Michael Walker. Today I'm joined by Ash Sarkar. What's up? Lovely for you, lovely for you coming here. <laughs> Thank you for you coming here. Uh, we'll also have James later on to talk about the Constitution and the Queen's speech. Uh, that video we started with was Theresa May, who just visited North Kensington. She's obviously a persona non grata in that part of town, quite rightly. Also increasingly unpopular across the country. Uh, the Tories had another fairly chaotic day today, especially in relation to Grenfell. They announced at one point that 600 tower blocks in the country had the same type of cladding as Grenfell did, which would mean it would all have to be immediately removed. They later retracted that to say there's in fact 600 buildings with cladding and they need to check them. They're all over the place. Uh, I talked on Monday about how ridiculous, how shameful it is that the government still were unable to say whether or not that cladding was illegal or not, whether or not it was be allowed to be put on a building or not. Uh, the Chancellor suggested on Andrew Marr that in fact it was illegal. Theresa May is now prevaricating again. Uh, so we're going to look at her under pressure in Parliament and her again being completely unsure whether or not this cladding that was looks like it was the cause of the fire spreading should have been there in the first place on fire safety has not yet actually met to look at how they could be improved. Mm -hmm. I will just add to the answer that I gave to the right honourable gentleman previously. And this is, I ask honourable members to remember that there is a criminal investigation taking place in relation to this matter. The testing, and it isn't, the testing of the cladding, the testing of the materials used, is being undertaken and a statement will be made by the police and the fire and, uh, service within the next 48 hours. Yeah, yeah. It's not as... James Cleverley. The cladding on the tower is a standard product that is available for sale. I don't understand why... So we've often criticised Yvette Cooper on this show. She asked a good question then uh, and Theresa May had... No answer. She was claiming she can't say whether or not the cladding was illegal because of a criminal investigation taking place. I mean, either it's illegal or it's not. People have been building buildings with this cladding or with cladding that's similar to this for years. If the government, after a week, can't tell us whether or not that was illegal, how the hell are property developers supposed to know? How is it going to be enforced if they, can't, if they don't know? Like, someone in the housing department has to know what material is legal and what material is illegal. Otherwise, how are they going to fulfil their responsibility, which is to keep us safe? It's impossible. Uh, it also came out this week that the cladding wasn't the only problem with the building. Uh, so the cladding, the problem with the cladding was that the fire could spread from flat to flat to flat, which isn't supposed to happen. Also, Sky revealed yesterday that the insulation, that's what sits between the cladding and the, build, and the people's homes, was released cyanide gas when burnt. Uh, they were interviewing a scientist called Richard Hull, who said that this was likely the cause of lots of the deaths in the building. Uh, the hospital has confirmed that there were three patients treated for cyanide poisoning. And again, this is something that the government should have known. This Richard Hull, this scientist, was saying they had warned about this before, and it's a tragedy that no one listened until tens of people were dead. Possibly hundreds of people were dead. We still don't know. That's another thing that the government's still being fairly unclear about. Uh, we also had news this week that I think some of us took up good news at first, yesterday, that people were going to be rehoused. The Evening Standard told us in luxury flats down the road. It sounded like potentially Jeremy Corbyn's call for empty luxury homes to be requisitioned and given over to people who'd been made homeless by this fire was coming to fruition. It turned out that, in fact, these were already assigned to be social housing. So nothing really has changed. What, how it works at the moment is when there's a property being developed, the council can demand of the developers that they put a certain percentage of those homes to affordable rent. Affordable rent can be as much as 80% of market rent. It can also be social rent, which is like council rent. Uh, so these buildings weren't luxury flats being brought over into public ownership. What this was is flats which were already had to be affordable are now being given to this set of people who've been made homeless from Grenfell. Obviously, I back that, but what it means is that there's 86, 86 families who are now going to find it harder to get a home in Kensington. I mean, we found out that there is no fairy tale ending for this story, right? Or at least not yet. 
So the thing about them being housed in this these luxury blocks is that they don't actually have access to the luxury aspects of it, mm -hmm. like the gym and the pool. You've got their wealthy neighbours complaining that, um, you know, dignified housing for people who have lost everything might impinge on their very moneyed and insulated existences somewhat. And you've also got problems where undocumented or irregular migrants are worried about their status. There's been a lot of mixed information about whether or not they'll be given reprieve and right to remain, or if it's just temporary respite. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that, you know, as much as the council and the government are trying to respond in a media-friendly way, the kind of uh, instinctual brutality of the state apparatus and also living in London under mm. neoliberalism just kind of keeps insidiously working its way in and snaking them, right? One way or another. Yeah. And that's what shows us that really it doesn't matter how good the response to this one particular tragedy is, although better response is definitely needed, there has to be a total radical overhaul of central government, of the culture in local authorities and councils and our entire approach to social and affordable housing. Mm. I mean, I think what's been, you're exactly right that however they treat the families who have been, have lost their homes in Grenfell, which should have been much better than it was, the issue is structural. You shouldn't have to have your house burnt down before you're offered social housing in central London, and in the borough that you're brought up in, the school that near the school that your children go to. And also, let's not lose sight of the big picture. I think it's really important for us to talk about the cladding, it's important for us to talk about the lack of alarms, so on and so forth, but there's a big picture here, and that is managed decline, right? It's something like 63.4% um, of all council housing in Kensington is due to be sold off, mm. right, because it was over the... Uh, threshold of um, high value housing right so there's a context here right the local authority and also the kind of um, quangos who are brought in to manage mm -hmm. uh, such council housing have an incentive to not take care of it and to um, encourage with whatever means they have at their disposal to disperse um, low income or otherwise precarious households and so that's the big picture here, which I think we really mustn't lose sight of. Which has been happening since the 80s as well, right? Yeah. So Margaret Thatcher didn't like that it was normal to live in a council home, so she made sure that anyone on a medium income was encouraged to buy a home, move out, and then that's how she was sort of intentionally creating the notion of a sink estate by moving mm -hmm. out people who had jobs and saying, no, this place isn't for you, yeah. and letting it fall into disrepair so that you could justify knocking down these places because they were bad for the working class anyway. Uh, and that is obviously a narrative we need to fight against. Uh, no surprises there. Um, also, yesterday, a charity single came out, which, mm -hmm. I don't know, I have mixed feelings about, but it did have a brilliant verse from yes. Stormzy. Stormzy, the people's poet. So I'm not actually going to try and spit this, because I think that'd be embarrassing. Yeah, it might be embarrassing. Not just for me, but I think... Well, we for... haven't got the, the background music on. Yes, that's why we're not doing it. Yeah, that's this. why I'm not going to um, but it te was... Another technical issue on the fix. <laughs> But um, it was a really beautiful opening verse. I think um, Stormzy is precisely the right person to do this. I think he's uh, perhaps one of the most introspective and sensitive of the grime artists out at the moment. So like, just like reading it, I don't know where to begin. So I'll start by saying I refuse to forget you. I refuse to be silenced. I refuse to neglect you. That's for every last soul up in Grenfell, even though I've never even met you, because that would have been my mum's house. Or that could have been my nephew. It could have been me up there, waving my plain white tee up there, with my friends on the ground trying to see up there. I just hope that you're resting and free up there. So, incredibly moving. It's got that kind of, uh, you know, signature Stormzy directness and simplicity and openness to it. And I think he's also speaking about an experience which is shared by not just many people in the grime scene, but young working class people of colour, chances are, if you know someone who lives in that borough, they lived in or around mm -hmm. Grenfell. Um, so AJ Tracy, who uh, came out in support of Corbyn and did a video on uh, the lack of affordable housing, Grenfell was in the background of that video. And also a friend of his who lived in Grenfell, who I think um, is amongst the casualties, and he said that he passed, um, had come down to see him like film this video, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is something which is uh, striking very close to many of the artists who uh, came out in support of 
um, a radical leftist labour alternative. It's not about just an abstract sense of like, ooh, these policies resonate. I think after Grenfell, it's really hit home um, just what the cost is mm -hmm. if we don't have a radical overhaul in politics. What do you think of the notion of a charity single for an event like this? Because I mean, because there's there's been an interesting interplay in the aftermath between solidarity actions mm -hmm. and charity. So the next day, the Evening Standard had a headline, London Unites, which seemed completely bizarre given all the interviews that had been on, on Sky News, if you've been watching it that day, which was people saying, these towers burnt down because the council hates mm -hmm. us because we're poor. And then you say, London Unites. And then they have a full page spread about their uh, fundraising scheme. You know, it's the, the sanitization of like the community, the community response is mm -hmm. not the fault of a charity single or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think like in a situation where the government response is so lacking and there have been so many unmet needs in terms of, you know, what uh, the people affected by this fire need, that yeah, people have got to pull together, get some peas by whatever means mm -hmm. available to them and distribute that. But I think that by no means does that mean that the people who are a part of this charity single, who are part of a uh, you know collection drive, mm. are any less aware of the structural yeah. problems there. And I think in terms of sanitising this disaster, that's something for all of us, whether we work in radical media or we're just like chances with a Twitter account, to push back against. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I found really striking uh, when I was talking to you know people who are in government and who are people who are part of like you know kind of media industrial complex is that in private there was a real callousness almost boredom mm -hmm. that they had to talk about these things and then in public there were like thoughts and prayers this is a tragedy da 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 da, -da. Mm. Um, and that language which is imprecise which is sentimental but not committal that's what we need to be you know mm -hmm. um, punching through yeah. You know? And I mean, in terms of charity singles, that's that Stormzy versus Miles away from Do They Know It's Christmas Time. Yeah. Um, and that which was obviously not. Right? Yeah, which. So he's. It's that that particular verse is clearly in solidarity because he's saying I, I associate or I identify with the victims of this. We're gonna move on to a next topic. Uh, just I suppose it's probably about a mile away from those towers. There's a very different building with people with very different life experiences, and they had a particularly ridiculous, pompous event yesterday which was the Queen's speech. We're going to watch 30 seconds of that and then we're going to bring on James Butler, our resident constitutional expert, to tell us what the hell is going on. My government will seek to maintain a deep and special partnership with the European allies and to forge new trading relationships across the globe. New bills on trade and customs will help to implement an independent trade policy and support will be given to help British businesses export to markets around the world. I mean, what is the Queen's Speech? <laughs> In the most uh, basic okay. terms. Well, the Queen's Speech is the speech from the throne. It's a, it's a speech the monarch gives in Parliament. It's part of the state opening of Parliament, which is has all of those kind of big, ridiculous processions. Uh, a lot of it comes back from, comes, you know, ultimately from, from the time of Charles I. So when, you know, Black Rod goes and summons the parliamentarians to the Lords, that ultimately comes from when uh, Charles I came down to Parliament uh, and said, hand me over these MPs, and Speaker Lentil said, uh, may it please your majesty, I have uh, neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak, save as this house direct me, which is a really important moment in, in the Commons asserting its sovereignty. Um, but yeah, so the Queen comes and delivers a speech, partly because Parliament functions essentially um, as an extension of, of mm -hmm. authority that's vested in the Crown. Her Majesty's but basically, Government. Basically, Her Majesty's Government. Her ringer delivers the speech. Basically, it, <laughs> basically it's, um, it's the government's programme yeah. for, for how, how it's going to conduct so legislation. It, that then gets voted on, uh, and if that vote uh, gets through, which usually it does, then the government, that's the government's basis for legislating yeah. for the rest of the parliamentary term. So the Queen's speech is, the pri it's not written by the Queen, the Prime Minister writes it or her, or her government or her yeah. advisors or whatever, yeah. and what it does is it lists all the, all the key legislation that they will plan to pass in that parliament, yeah. which normally would be one year, but this time they made it two years yeah. for extra stability during the Brexit negotiations. Uh, this <laughs> year's speech was more notable for what it missed out than what it included, right? So obviously yeah, the Tories true. had some pretty bullshit yeah, uh, policies yeah, yeah. in their manifesto, the dementia tax, yeah. fox hunting, getting rid of free school yeah. meals for, for little kiddies. Yeah. 
Uh, Grammar schools. They've all gone. Yeah, yeah, they've all gone. What stayed? Uh, what stayed? Well, I mean, the other things that are gone are also important. Um, the prison reform is out. Yeah. Now, that's actually quite important. Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons pretty annoyed that that's gone. Yeah. Uh, the only good thing Gove ever did in office, by the way, mm. was propose prison reform. Not great. And they got rid of it. Not great, but important. Well, you know. What is wrong with these people? No, they were going to abolish a serious fraud office. That's gone. Um, not very much on extremism. Now, Theresa May had a big crusade about extremism. Are we on gone or remain now? But they're still gone. They're still now, gone. the things that remain, yep. or the things that are the, the main focus, is important because these, you know, the shape of the legislation here is, is strange. What remains is the is the, the what used to be called the Great Repeal Bill. It's now lost the weird little it's just great, a repeal bill. It's just now. a repeal bill. That is, so basically most of the the major legislation in this Parliament is going to be uh, Brexit related. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, as you said, she doesn't want to pass another Queen's speech in a year's time, probably because she's going to be very, very imperiled and very weak feeling uh, in, in about a year, if she's even still there. <laughs> she's going to be feeling weak uh, feeling in a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, now she feels now. now. So, so there's the, the legislation itself, um, which is a bit, bit kind of constitutionally weird because it, it gives the government or it will probably, uh, well, it's going to have to grant the government so-called Henry VIII powers. Now, these are powers which will allow the government... Um, to basically retrospectively amend legislation that they pass yeah, yeah, yeah. without scrutiny. So they can issue... So Henry VIII ruled by proclamation, and that's where the name comes from. So the government will have very, very broad powers to, to amend legislation. This is when they, so they repeal the... So what was EU law becomes British law, so, and in the process of becoming British law, they can add some amendments, some cheeky sort amendments. Of. Um, so they, they repeal... It's, it's called a repeal because they're repealing the European Communities Act of yeah. 1972. Um, but in doing so, they preserve um, quite a lot of EU legislation, save in certain areas where they say, oh, we're just correcting it to fit with British law. But actually, that correction is going to involve pretty major policy decisions in the area of regulation, perhaps workers' safety, mm -hmm. things human like rights? this. Human rights is a slightly different matter, because human rights is, 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 will, will have its own kind of uh, 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 legislative structure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there will be human rights issues that crop up, and those will be policy decisions as well. Now, there are, there are also eight separate bills which have been carved out from, uh, from this, which are uh, in areas like agriculture and fisheries, immigration, um, uh, uh, trade, tax, stuff mm -hmm. like that. These, these are competences which are going to be really important. And they're going to have separate bills, which are probably also going to be enabling acts in the yeah. same way. They're I want to move us on to... Yeah. Is it even going to get passed, right? Because now what happens is they debate it for a week. Or, I don't know. Do Until they debate Wednesday, it for a week? Wednesday and Thursday. So Until this is the bit I don't get. Yeah. Okay, so there will be votes on Wednesday and Thursday. Labour will have, an, have the uh, potential to lay amendments. Yeah. I assume what Labour is going to do is lay an amendment that says, uh, no, we're not going to do this, we'll do this. Instead. But you can amend the speech. You can amend the speech. So the speech you can... And the Queen don't have to read it again. No, the Queen doesn't have to read it again. Um, so, because the the Queen, the Queen, so, so what happens is the Queen issues the speech um, and then it comes to Parliament uh, and it's there debated. Now, historically, um, so 1924, for instance, yeah. um, when the minority government brought a, a King's speech, as it was then, Stanley, Stanley Baldwin, um, and uh, the government then said, the, the Commons, he did, it was minority government, Commons then debated it and, the, and Labour said, well, but we're appending a vote of no confidence. Government collapses. Oh, they collapsed? Uh, yeah. So and this then, time... And that brings in the first ever Labour government. Okay. So if the Labour government this time says, we, we want to move to a vote of no confidence. So basically, actually, let's, let's take it a step back <laughs> in terms of, like, assumptions. If that vote happens and they lose, mm -hmm. if the Queen's speech gets voted down, and that would presumably be because the DUP haven't... The DUP haven't sort of like agreed to go along with it for the mm -hmm. Tories because the case is going to be. Which can the, is quite unlikely. Can the Tories mm -hmm. get the DUP on side to vote through their Queen's speech? Yeah. If if imagine it gets voted down, what happens? New elections? Uh, well, no, not immediately. Presumably, the government will resign, um, and in that case, so a Queen's speech historically will be taken as a confidence vote. Yeah. But because of the influence of the fixed or well, the structure in the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, it's not automatically. A vote of confidence, but presumably the government will resign. Um, there will then be a, a period in which uh, <laughs> our man Corbyn can form well, the government. Well, I mean, either the Conservatives, With the Lib Dems, and either, the DUP. Either the Conserv well, no, either the Conservatives will put forward, uh, an, you know, another government, or yeah. or, or, or Corbyn. Will it's it's a bit constitutionally murky. Um, I don't. That's not very likely to happen, mm -hmm. precisely because the DUP do not want to see a Corbyn government mm -hmm. happen. 
There will also, I imagine, be some reticence on Labour's part to form a minority government rather than proceed to a general election. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be wise for the Labour Party to try and push for another election mm -hmm. rather than form... Because if they do form a government, then they're stuck mm -hmm. by the Fixed Term Parliaments Act because then they ha either have to issue a vote of no confidence in their own government, which looks a bit weird, um, or they have to pass a motion for an early general election, yeah. which will require a lot of Tory votes. Which will require two-thirds majority. Two-thirds majority. And some of our more fearful than usual Tories won't want an election because they're going to lose to the People's, people's Labour, Labour Party yeah, 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 in the late 2017 yeah. People's yeah. Landslide. <laughs> uh, so and also, like, the DUP, like, successfully hustled some more money, right, for... Well, it's not clear. So yeah. get Moolah from Northern Ireland. Well, there, yeah, there's, there's the rumours. There are, there, there are rumours that they're trying to get money from Northern Ireland, but that triggers the Barnet formula, which is a big question. So that so means that if they give Northern Ireland the money, they have to also give it to Scotland, and they have they to also have give to it to Wales. They have to proportionally spend uh, yeah. across. And this, in is the other big story here, mm -hmm. is the, the return of the regional question mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, the West Lothian question in another form, um, which is, you know, English votes for English yeah. laws. That's going to be an issue okay. in this parliament. So essentially, um, but essentially, all things, <laughs> all things considered, we're probably going to get next Wednesday, the Queen's speech passes, with the DUP backing it, yeah. the DUP having got a little bit more money for Northern Ireland, that means Scotland and Wales get a little bit more, and we have a very weak May government that sort of plods along until the next big beef yeah, in Parliament, be either with her backbenchers or with the DUP. Which will be the Brexit legislation, yeah. I think. Um, and that's going to be a real big problem. And it should be a big problem because it's a minority government. Um, there is a real question whether this government has legitimacy to negotiate Brexit. There's also a big question about whether they have now the parliamentary power to put mm -hmm. through the stuff that they would be able to do as a majority government. That's a big opening for the Labour Party. Exciting times. Thank you, James. <laughs> We're going to swap seats. We're going to swap seats. Oh, dear. Better than a Corbyn high five, wasn't any. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Ash. Yo. Uh, on Monday... Um, it was with Aaron. Me and Aaron uh, mentioned the Finsbury Park attack, but we mm -hmm. didn't go into too much detail. I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. Yeah, so... Um, Sorry, that face was something going through here, not me. Sorry. Yeah, introduce. Dad? So, I guess like maybe the first thing to say is that I grew up in North London. Finsbury Park Mosque is... And the Welfare Centre on Seven Sisters Road is a place that I walk past basically every day. Um, so this was very close to home, both geographically, but also um, cognitively and emotionally. The basics are that um, after uh, evening prayers, so just like around midnight, just after midnight on Sunday mm -hmm. night, a van driven by Darren Osborne plowed into uh, worshippers who were leaving the welfare centre one man died. I think two people are still in critical condition. Others were injured. Um, the police, there are, uh, shall we say, conflicting accounts of how long it took for them to arrive. So uh, police are saying 10 minutes. People who were there are saying more like half an hour, even 40 minutes. And uh, the perpetrator had to be held down by uh, members of the mosque community. And since then, there's been a lot of grief, um, a lot of anger, um, a lot of recriminations in the sense of people are looking at the kind of output of the Express and the Mail, the Katie Hopkinses of the world and saying, well, you've planted the seeds mm -hmm. of this kind of uh, burning resentment and kind of uh, bloodthirstiness towards Muslims. And there's also been an incredible community response. So the vigil was like really well attended. There was really beautiful words spoken and also really politically salient and even confrontational words being spoken as well. The thing that I want to talk about, because this is something which I've been mulling over for the last few days, is a question of what is the political utility of calling what happened on Sunday night, Sunday morning, a terrorist attack. Now, I understand completely why, I'm just going to like jettison white people from the discussion for a second, why Muslims are saying, we want this to be called a terrorist attack, we want this person to be othered and vilified the same way that any Muslim would be, we want a state response which uh, makes mosques more secure or more securitized, and we want a state response which... Uh, 
seems to value protecting Muslims and Muslim lives. And we also want to kind of um, repurpose some of the language which has been generally racialized, like hate preacher, extremism, radicalization, and apply it to white people and far right acts of violence. So I fully understand where this comes from because it's an urge that I feel myself as well. Where I question it is in uh, two respects. One is that it gets a little bit more theoretical, which is, well, are there different kinds of terrorism? Is there a terrorism which disrupts the logic of the state? And is there one which coheres with the logic of the state, which in some ways might be seen as an extension of the logic of the state? And the other is, well, why aren't we calling this a racist murder? Now, when the news initially broke, it was being covered as a suspected Islamic terrorist incident by CNN and their national security expert. It seems to me that anyone can be a national security expert. I was like, I know this man. He works in John Lewis. Um, so it was being um, referred to as Islamic terrorism. And I think that's because of this aspect of the van. Um, Aaron, who I was chatting to before, was like, well, this is now recognised as part of like, the terrorist tactical repertoire. So I think we can look at that as a kind of racialised component, right? We're not talking in terms of skin colour, we're talking in terms of floating signifiers now. And I think that's affected how it's covered. Because people have been murdered after evening prayers for a long time. And half the time we don't even know the names of the perpetrators or indeed the names of the victims. They're not treated as national security issues. Indeed, they're not even covered as national news. Now, do we say, well, let's retrospectively call those terrorist incidents too? Or, and this is what I think, we place it within the context of racist murders that have a history in this country extending well before 9-11. Now, like, as part of the research that I was doing into this idea, I realised that other than Altab Ali and Stephen Lawrence, I couldn't name any other victims of racist murders. And that, in my head, there's a kind of paradisal period between the death of Stephen Lawrence and 9-11 in which state multiculturalism is hegemonic and nothing bad ever happens. Now... This is bullshit. In that time, there are two murders which I think are, are of particular significance. One is Donna O'Dwyer in 1994, and the other is Michael Menson in 1997. Let's start with Michael Menson for a second. So this was characterised by a real reticence on the part of the police to characterise this as a racist murder. Uh, he was killed in Edmonton, which is... Uh, I went to school there and grew up around the corner from there. I never knew this man's name. Like, There's no wreck named after him. There's no... Michael Menson Fund. Um, he was killed by uh, two young racists who were set alight and the police for ages were trying to argue that he set himself alight. The other case, Donna Rodwyer, and the reason why I say this is significant is that her flat was set on fire by a man with like neo-Nazi sympathies who collects all the memorabilia so in lots of ways he's like Thomas Mayer. Now we don't refer to either of these as terrorist incidents because the kind of method here isn't recognised as part of the terrorist repertoire though I would say it's certainly spectacular. So what do we get from placing it within this context? Well, it means we're talking about ideas around Britishness, citizenship, migration, empire. We're not looking for a state response because both of these cases were characterised by a real miscarriage of justice, right? We know that the state will not protect people of colour. Um, I'm wary of a response that demands more police around mosques, more armed police around mosques, um, because there's no way to do that without it being um, more surveillance for Muslims. It's interesting to me mm. that people are saying more police for mosques and not more police for Cardiff, which is where this guy came from. Um, and it says that actually what we need is a community, grassroots, anti-racist movement, which obviously engages with the state and its demands for justice, but doesn't set its definitions of justice around the definitions of the state. I don't know what you guys think of that. I mean, I suppose one reason why people want it to be called terrorism is mm. partly to, to have the sort of equality between mm -hmm. when it's done by a Muslim person, uh, but also so that the media and the police give it the, a, a certain amount of seriousness mm. and give it a certain amount of, of time. Because mm. I suppose in both of those examples you gave, as, as in Stephen Lawrence, part of the problem, well, a big problem was endemic racism in the police, but that translated into a passivity, you know, a kind of sort of just not taking it very seriously and not well, really bothering to investigate. Cover up, mm. uh, cover up of a passivity, right? Yeah. Um, and so by calling it terrorism, that has a repertoire attached to it, which means that the media and the police take it seriously. I know obviously 
we should expect that the police and the media take racist attacks mm -hmm. seriously. I suppose that's the, the argument really, isn't it? That we should be yeah. fighting for the police to take racist attacks seriously instead of making something have to be called terrorism before mm -hmm. it gets the, the attention it deserves. And that's why I say I understand this completely. Yeah. But I don't think that our only word for serious should be terror. Yeah. No, I agree. But the, I don't think the two positions are necessarily conflictual. Mm. Um, because one of the things that I think is quite important is to recover the history of terrorism prior to, mm. uh, you know, sort of post-2001. Mm. Um, and that involves going back and looking at the history of right-wing terrorism, but also left-wing terrorism mm. uh, in Europe, which is, a, you know, a good 120 years old. A um, little older, in fact. Um, and that tells us that, th that there is a specific mode that terrorists undertake, which is all to do with sort of mediatization. Um, you know, terrorism arises as part of the first big globalization, the first rise of like massive print media. And it is to do with that kind of mediation, the highly spectacular targets, and the provocation of state responses, mm. thus to sharpen the contradictions, which is, I think, uh, one of the things that's going on here. So I think we can see it as a resurgence of a particular kind of terrorist activity among the far right, precisely because they can't make the electoral gains that they have wanted to do in the past, and they can't make the kind of mass uh, street violence that they've wanted to do in the past, with the caveat that there was a, you know, a very strong EDL march yeah. in Manchester the other week. But, but again, that kind of like mass street demonstration doesn't seem to be uh, you know, attractive to the, the I'm these gonna people. I'm just going to cut in there, because I think this is... We definitely need to discuss this <laughs> for a longer period of time on a podcast, but we've got a minute left, ah. so I'm going to give you the final word on this issue, and then we're, we're ending. It's over. Is this me exercising this my Muslim privilege? Well, this is you responding. It was your story. You get, you get final response. I think that we need to ask seri serious questions about what we want from the state in terms of protecting us. I don't want to see more cops around mosques or indeed any other places of worship because they should be spaces for vulnerable people, sometimes disruptive people, and they should be welcome to all. Now that is not to say mosques should be considered open targets, I just think that we need to think about other forms of protection and we should not in any way trust the media or mainstream politicians when they say well now we're taking this seriously because where were you all this time? Brilliant. Thank you for that final point. Thank you so much for uh, elucidating what the hell was going on in Parliament <laughs> yesterday. And thank you as ever for joining us. Uh, and thank you for watching. Uh, if you've got any thoughts on the show, tweet us, comment in the live feed. We love your chat. <laughs> and see you on Monday. <laughs> Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Victory for real people. Us. It's about us. But for all of the darkness, every cause has an effect. 40 years on the roof of Melbourne. <laughs> For all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navarra Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarra events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarramedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started.